Welcome to Church Pulse Weekly. It's Carrie Newhoff here along with David Kinneman. Hello, David. California looks very sunny today. Uh, well, it doesn't it always. It's always showing off. Uh, it tries to at <laughs> least. Uh, but yeah, it's you, beautiful down here. You're the one, though, who taught me about the June gloom. I think I went down to see you years ago, and it was like cloudy almost every day in June. And you're like, yeah, that's June gloom. Never heard of that before. Yeah, it's funny because summer in uh, California is actually the I think one of the least desirable seasons here. Um, so May gray and June gloom. It even goes into July. It's the, uh, I can't. What is it explain. the July fry? What, Cause it all rhymes. <laughs> what, what's July? Well, well, it's still cloudy and that's the point, but they couldn't oh. that, that rhymes with, with the, the June gloom. But the, um, so what happens is there's this marine layer that's, that settles in and uh, as the, whatever the meteorological reasons are, uh, I couldn't explain them, but um, there's more, there's more haze. There's more, there's more marine layer. It's pretty gloomy and foggy in uh, May and then especially June. So people come out for vacation in June to California and it's, it can be pretty cold and miserable. Um, I think there was this famous quote from uh, Mark Twain who said he's never been colder than summer in San Francisco, uh, which <laughs> kind of reflects that, that same idea. But um, yeah, it, uh, right now here uh, in March, it's a beautiful spring day and the, the, the trees are budding as they do most of the, most of the year because it's yeah. green here. But um, anyway, it's a beautiful day uh, here at the, at the Southern, in Southern California. Well, we are looking for signs of hope. So sunshine is always welcome. And we're going to have a great conversation about giving back, which is a great subject, volunteering a little bit. We have a couple of guests today that we're going to introduce listeners to shortly. For those of you who are new to the podcast, welcome. We are really thrilled to be able to do this week after week. And David Kinneman and I, Barna and my little company, we started this a couple of years ago in partnership with Glue to try to serve leaders through the biggest crisis of our lifetime. And uh, an unstable world continues. So we're going to keep bringing you conversations that we hope can help you realize your mission. So David, you've gathered some data as usual. Um, this, I believe, from the state of generosity and cities. Will you tell us a little bit about what you're learning about giving back in this season? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Well, uh, COVID, the last two years have changed a lot of things. Um, and one of them is volunteering and how we get people to show up for events and how we get people to help when people show up for events. Uh, also, the digital volunteering, the whole, the whole gamut. But um, we asked a question in our survey about giving back. And we found that half of U.S. adults agree that they're always thinking about ways they can give back, financial, hmm. volunteering, other things. It's a pretty big number, but, you know, Americans... Yeah, that is a big number. Americans stand out. They're, they're, they, have, um, they have high high aspirations about the things they would like to do. Hmm. And, um, and um, they don't always follow through on those things, we'll be clear, but they, but they, do, but they do have... A but nice intentions, self. right? They Good do. intentions. They, they do. And we all know about uh, the road, the road to good, of good intentions, don't we? But, <laughs> um, but um, practicing Christians are more likely than non-practicing Christians to agree. They're always thinking about ways to give back. So there, we do see a faith difference, which is which is uh, a good thing. And then volunteering during the pandemic is another uh, thing we've been tracking. So 13% of churchgoers said they had volunteered online with their church during the pandemic. An interesting stat: one in eight uh, of all churchgoers. 17% of churchgoers said they volunteered in person with their hmm. church and 12% said they volunteered in the community through church efforts uh, over the course of the pandemic. So um, hmm. we're going to be talking today to some pastors in Philadelphia, uh, Brad and Leah Leach, and we'll talk a little about some of the things that they're doing uh, to, to, to recognize and mobilize the volunteers. Um, and we'll, uh, can't wait to, for you all to meet them. Yeah, I don't want to put you on the them. spot. But I don't think I've ever, in all these years of you know being involved in the church and leading one for two decades, I don't think I've ever run into a stat, not that they're not out there, about how many people actually volunteer. It would seem to me it would be under 20% of a church would typically volunteer. Do you have any idea what the normal stat is on that? No, I don't actually. It doesn't oh. come to mind. Yeah. Well, there's your next study, David. You see? Well, I, I could have made something up on the spot and you all would have believed it. But well, 77% of my statistics are made up on the spot. Yours aren't, <laughs> but that's okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Exactly. But you get, if you think about a church with, you know, 1,500 people in attendance, maybe three or 4,000 who call at home, typically you would have five to 600 attenders, maybe 700. I don't know. Or uh, volunteers, I should say. So I'm just curious. Okay. Uh, anything else to share? Um, well, the other thing we want to talk about is volunteering digitally. We, we mentioned one stat yeah. there. 
uh, about the percent who had said they had volunteered digitally at 13%. Uh, but half of churchgoers said that they they are ways for them to volunteer digitally at church. You know, clearly, as we were talking today, <clears throat> there's less and less uh, exclusive um, work in terms of um, digital volunteering at digital church. I mean, there's now more and more. Most churches are back in person. I do think that the long the long impact of COVID is that there will be more and more digital. Mm -hmm. uh, most churches are sort of still streaming their services, and, and there's more of a hybrid church experience for a lot of people. So to finish that thought, we find that half of churchgoers uh, said that they recognize that there are ways for them to volunteer digitally, and that might be an opportunity for churches to consider. There's in-person opportunities, right. and still going forward, there's some other things you could do virtually. Um, the other thing I just want to mention Mm -hmm. um, before before we bring on our guest is uh, there was another study that we've been working on where we look at giftedness across the church and and ways to mobilize people according to their gifts and we find that only one in four adults and only three in ten practicing Christians say they've ever taken an assessment or a spiritual gifts or um, you know strengths finder or any of those kinds of inventories. I was actually really surprised. I'm not often surprised by data. I usually get, you know, pretty good gut on how the the st statistics are going to show up. But I was surprised that only 30% of practicing Christians said they'd ever taken an online test that might help them identify their gift. Yeah, that and seems a that's, little bit low. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you sort of in our circles, right? You kind of hear a lot about strengths finders or Myers Briggs or uh, the Enneagram, but but only three in ten. So seven in ten practicing Christians have never had that kind of assessment done. And and I think it should be in the church 100%. I think we should be the very best at understanding and, and mobilizing people according to their giftedness, uh, not just to serve, you know, in the children's ministry, but to also serve out in the community and become the kind of salt and light in the world. Um, and it's with that that I think we can bring in uh, Brad and Leah, because I've had the chance of attending um, their church, City Life in Philly, um, a number of times over the last year and a half during the pandemic. Welcome, guys. Thanks for joining the Church Pulse Weekly today. Mm -hmm. Hey guys, great good to, to be here, you, Brad. Good to have yeah, you, Leah. So Let me give a, a brief bio. Uh, so Brad serves as a lead pastor at City Life in Philly. He is a founder and lead pastor of City Life and loves to preach inspiring messages, help people laugh, cry, and love Jesus more deeply. Leah, his wife, serves as ministries pastor at City Life. She grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where she worked in full-time kids and middle school ministry before marrying Brad and joining him in Michigan. So welcome. We're glad to have both of you today. Hi, thank you. It's great to be here. <laughs> yeah, David, why don't you kick things off? And uh, yeah, I'd, I'd love, because you you know them, you've been to their church, you've you've visited. Um, what's on your mind and what do you see that that brings hope? Well, first, I just want to say thanks so much for uh, your faithful service through the pandemic and, you know, sort of speaking to you guys and then speaking to, to our listeners. You know, I like, it's been such a tough two years and, mm. uh you know, being, being able to travel to Philly, um, you know, about every, every couple months and just sort of tracking along with you guys over the last 12 plus months, you know, it's, it's, uh, things are a little easier now than they were, but just good, good job and, and well done through these, <laughs> these you. tough, these tough months. And, uh, you know, I know I sort of feel like, um, yeah, I just wanted to encourage you and, and thereby encourage all of our, our uh, listeners and viewers about that. And so one of the reasons why I wanted you guys to be on this this uh, show with us was that um, I was there in Philadelphia a few weeks ago and you guys do a thing called the onesies, which was a uh, Friday night. And uh, I'll let you describe the, the, the event, what, where it came from, but it was such a fun, a fun night. So funny, so enjoyable as you guys celebrated people that were serving into your church community. Tell us all about the onesies and uh, where it came from. Yeah, well, the name kind of comes off of our mission statement. Uh, we exist to lead the one far from God to pursue full life in Christ. And so even that vocabulary, the one represents for us, you know, the heart of what we're trying to do. It's about people, names, faces. And so the onesies is a night where we just go all out uh, to honor everyone who serves in our church. We give away uh, various awards throughout the night that have unique names. And then at the end, the annual onesies award that just recognizes somebody in the church that's embodied the mission, um, mm -hmm. in a really unique way. 
And it's part Oscars. We roll out the red carpet. You know, we call people up. The music plays. They have a speech that we've written out that they read that, you know, is funny and very personal to them. And um, it's part The Tonight Show. Uh, so I'll kick off with a little, you know, Jimmy Fallon stand up. This year we pulled a little Saturday Night Live into it and had a weekend update. And so it's just very fun. Uh, that really is the heart of the night to say thank you mm -hmm. to people who serve to, you know, make, make church happen. Yeah, it's, this was the sixth one that we've been able to do. Um, so it's kind of evolved through the years, but it's become, um, a really special thing for people to look forward to. We've had people join our dream team just so that they could come to the onesies to be, <laughs> to be a part of it. Um, so that's been a really special thing to see it evolve. And it really came out of our um, team culture. So uh, just we crafted several years ago, just team values that we have that we really want to embody. One of those being um, contagious fun that we want um, mm. our, our team culture here to be contagious fun for all of our leadership team. And so um, we really just decided that this night, the focus was gonna be honor and fun. We weren't gonna do vision casting. We weren't gonna try to, to raise money for anything. We weren't gonna do, we didn't want any of our volunteers to serve at it. This was just for them to be able to be celebrated and honored and thanked for all that they do every week. So we ask them to come prepared every week to serve the one. And so we put a lot of work, budget, energy into really being prepared to serve them on this night. It strikes me that contagious fun is something not a lot of people would use a term that's not a lot of people would use it to describe their church. So it's like, yeah, fun, maybe once in a while, but like contagious fun. Can you say more about that? Like, how do you do that without being schmaltzy or, you know, like, like it, it sounds like you guys have fun, like that's a core value, but what are, what are some of the things that really make that like a genuine delight? Yeah, well, I mean, that's the word. It has to be genuine. It has to be authentic, I think, to who you are. And any church's values should authentically come out of the heart and DNA of, you know, what the leaders embody. Um, I'm married to an Enneagram 7. She brings the fun. I was going to ask where the 7 was because there's you know, like, everything that we do. Like 8s don't you know. come up with that, okay? And neither do 3s or 1s. So somebody had to be a 7 you know, in the mix. Yeah, to me, a meeting's a win if it's efficient. To her, it's a, you know, it's a win if it's fun. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, but I, you know, I think even when, even in looking at the past few years, um, you know, it's, it's just such a heavy time in the world. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and now, I mean, we've got war, we've got, mm -hmm. you know, virus, we've got all of, all of the stuff that's, that's really, really heavy. And I think, you know, in a healthy church family, just like in any family, you know, you're going to experience, and you should be experiencing the whole range of human emotions. And so, you know, as a church family, there are going to be times to grieve and lament. Um, but sometimes I think we can even dramatize grief a little more than we need to. And so mm. we got to be able to swing it the other way, too, and laugh and celebrate the mission. I think, you know, volunteers want to feel like they're winning. Uh, mm. They want to feel like they're a part of something that is moving forward, that's making an eternal difference. And one of the best ways we found to be able to do that is to just laugh and help people feel good about what's being done and about what's happening. And it really is contagious. It's, it's infectious and it makes people want to be around each other. It makes people want to <laughs> be tuned in and engaged. Yeah, I think, too, we try to incorporate it, not just to this event, but like when we have a new guest welcome lunch, like we're going to always play a game with them in the room uh, and our team culture, we have like onesies that awards that we give out there, but on our team meetings, uh, a couple of times a year, we'll give out a funsy award to someone on our staff. That's really kicking it some way. And the, it's like an actual little trophy of like, like a donkey kicking his legs in the air. Cause <laughs> Yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> but um so that's something that we just want to incorporate into all that we're doing to be able to to cultivate that as a family as well hmm. so i've been in my uh years and years and years as a pastor's kid and you know christian college uh, student and then working at a christian organization i've been to a lot of church events a lot of church services 
And I, th I think the onesies event was the most fun I've ever had. And, and wow. the most I've, yeah. That's I mean, very I mean, high praise, David. Maybe, For a PK, well, a PK to say that? <laughs> Maybe it's maybe it's a low bar, though, because, uh, <laughs> you know, it, it feels to me like it feels to me like humor and fun and 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 the right side of that, because I think I think, you know, there's a there's a whole element to which I think communicators have, um, you know, gotten so good sometimes at that shtick. And I do think that part yeah. of our challenge today mm -hmm. with especially emerging generations is they sort of see through that. Um, and, and if you're not actually really funny. Uh, and if you're not if you're not authentic to how you can be funny, and you're trying to play a role, or you hear other preachers or communicators who are funny, um, so I think I think you guys, for me, and just seeing the room that night and and experiencing it, it was like it was really it was really delightful, and it was very different than I expected. I didn't go in with a lot of expectations, um, <clears throat> one way or the other, but it was just a very delightful. It was so well done. It was you had a live band. And and Brad, you're you're very funny. Uh, you you could you could do comedy, um, and um, and so I think I think it it inspired me, and I wanted to have you guys on the podcast to talk about this for for leaders about about how can we embody that kind of recognition of others. One of the things that I noticed about it was the degree to which you you know so so as Brad said, each person will win. But the, there's what? How did you give out about twenty awards that night? Something like that. I think it was fourteen. Okay. Um, uh, counting is not my, my game, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> People can be worried for those following <laughs> to the intro where, where stats are not made up. But, um, but um, you gave away 14. They're, they're, you know, these statuettes of these Oscars, really, really cool things. And then you, then you wrote up a, a speech, an acceptance speech for each person to give. And so, which was great because, you know, people sometimes hate the mic. And so you help them if they hate the mic and you help <laughs> those that would love to say a few words, uh, like have a short crisp thing. And so, <laughs> and, and, but, but I want you as, as listeners to think about the fact that, that uh, City Life and Brad and Leah and their team pay such close attention to their volunteers that each person is, is written a very personalized script to come up to the stage, accept the award mm -hmm. and say, Hi, I'm the person who takes all the photos and I'm the one who, you know, is kind of is kind of creeping you out. But I'm, you know, it's like, and so there's this this really um, there's this real sense of seeing people and acknowledging and recognizing them for the contributions that they're making. And I just think more churches uh, should be embodying that kind of seeing, recognizing, and then celebrating uh, the the people, not who just make the church run. But who are on mission with Jesus, and that's what I really love about you guys, Brad and Leah. So, say more hmm. about what, what, um, what that's like during the year to sort of recognize and see people for the the ways that they're bringing, you know, their whole selves to to what you guys are are doing, what God's doing. Well, you know, I think honor is powerful when it's specific and it's personal, and uh, it carries over. You know, the ones he says a carryover effect. It's a culture shaping event. So it carries over even into the weekends to follow. One of my favorite moments actually came, came a couple of weeks after the onesies this year. We were in a pre-service huddle with our experience teams. And um, the leader who was leading the huddle just said, hey, let's pick two people. Let's just encourage them. And one of the, one of the volunteers who got picked was Peter, um, who's a semi-retired um, guy in our church who – uh, helps run some video cameras and he uh, we're going around the circle encouraging him and one of the girls who jumped in was Emily who's an eighth grader in our church and so you're seeing in the circle this eighth grade girl who's speaking very specific encouragement and honor to somebody you know who could be her grandfather and um, it just feels so healthy and that comes from I think modeling it as a leadership team I think one of the reasons honor can get a little funky in churches is because it only flows one direction and that's up, you know, to the senior leaders, but honor, so when, true. when it's healthy, it's, you know, it's 360 degrees. It's moving in every direction. It's, you know, leaders honoring um, teams, teams, honoring leaders, volunteers, honoring one another. Um, one story, you know, that we, that really stood out to us from the onesies this year was, 
one of our one of our really faithful volunteers, her husband came with her and he is not into church, um, wants nothing to do with it, has been burned by church, very skeptical. And he came in and he was so drawn in to the spirit of honor. He would never have called it that. He probably would have been turned off if he would have even heard that term used. Um, that he was, as the night was going on, on his feet, he was like shouting and cheering for random people who were coming up, getting awards that he had never met. Um, and at the end of the event, there was a girl who actually fell on her way out as she was leaving the building and he was there and he had been so drawn in. He went, he picked her up. He carried her by himself into one of the kids' rooms off in the back and ended up at the end of the night, driving her 45 minutes home. And the volunteer in our church said, whatever happened that night, like, let's keep it going because he's never that way. But he it was some, you know, our church would never have connected with him in any other kind of format. But just that night of multi-generational, multi-ethnic people honoring one another, you know, it's something that doesn't happen in any other environment for people. You know, moms are not having their kids, you know, give them a round of applause for dinner. (laughs) At, you know, at the end of a night, like there's no other environment where people are being honored specifically for their personality, their gifts, their talents for who they are. And so yeah. I think it's infectious when people see it. Yeah. And I think the other piece to that that we've seen um, is that we just know that serving and um, volunteering is really a part of discipleship. And just it's not something that, that we want people just to fill in roles on a Sunday morning. And we say that and then we feel the pressure of, yeah, but we really do have to yeah. fill these roles in. But to just stop and pause and to know, love and challenge people um, to be able to know them personally. One of our favorite volunteer stories that night was a lady who's been serving. She came in during the, the during COVID, during the pandemic not really involved in church at all. Um, And as a police officer would work overnight shifts and come right to church. And she discovered, and she laughs about it now. She's like, I didn't even know that I liked people before I came (laughs) to this church. But now she is the most amazing greeter and finds new people like it's unbelievable. And she finds them and she connects them and she takes them to people and she helps them get connected. Just like she felt like she got connected. And it's like a whole other aspect of the way that God made her that she didn't even know about herself until she started being able to serve. And so it's a really beautiful thing to see people discovering what they were created to do and love doing it. And and that's really the thing that we want to celebrate that we love doing personally to be able to be a part of that. Yeah, she invited a- her boss, her captain came and he said to her, I don't even recognize you yeah. <laughs> because she was so unlike, you know, the way that she had just kind of been trained to be in the other environments in her life mm-hmm. and serving pulled that out of her, her true personality. Mm-hmm. It's so cool. Yeah. Well, I, I just, am, and just sitting back smiling here as you guys tell these stories and, and um, uh, that little detail of someone getting injured, I, I was actually standing right there as that happened. And, uh, you know, Brad, you also went out and helped carry that person up the stairs. And, you know, it was quite a moment just as people were, you know, there was a, a selfie station with a cool, you know, cool camera and all the things and uh, people having, you know, coffees and gelatos and dancing in the other room. And so like there was, it was a true party, real fun. And then someone got hurt and, you know, the community rallied around, picked her up. Um, I, I was going to ask you guys, I, I forgot to do the, the next Sunday when I, that was a, the event was Friday night and I was going to ask you on Sunday how, how she was going, but, um, you know, uh, yeah, but, um, but Brad also, in, in addition to that person sort of lifted that person, you know, this, this injured person up and carried, carried them in. So it's a, uh, it's quite a, quite a community and it's just fun to see you guys leading and serving in, in this way. Well, I got one more question for you guys before we wrap up. The time's gone so fast, but um, most church leaders are saying we can't get volunteers right now. Like we're really struggling with that. What are some other principles or practices that you've found? Because clearly you've got volunteers to celebrate and they want to be there and it's a great event. What are some principles that have been really good in, you know, supporting your volunteers, finding new ones and helping them fulfill their purpose? I think um, 
the one of you know we say that we serve the one we we look to reach the one and i think that's honestly what it's felt like especially mm. during the covid season um is to just be able to say we just need to find all of us need to find like one this week and just the practice of shoulder tapping um doing announcements from stage or sending out emails like mass emails like it just isn't going to work as well but but to be able to just specifically see somebody um on a sunday and it has to start from a place of knowing them it can't be hmm. a sales pitch um but it really has to come from a place of discipleship and so um that's where anybody interested and trying to serve we immediately have them connect in a one-on-one -on -one connection with someone on our team to get to know their story tell us about what you love doing tell us about some of those specific things have you ever taken a spiritual gifts test have you ever served and so we just try to immediately connect them to hmm. a place where they might like to serve and we also make it very clear they are not signing up for the rest of their lives yeah. to do this one position try but try it out and i actually learned a lot from that we had somebody serving in a role for several years um i thought she was great and she just kind of came to me and was like I've been waiting for someone to ask me to switch to a different position because I don't like doing this job at all. And it was such a like light bulb moment for me to, it's not once they're in place, that's not the end of the conversation. That is just the start of what's happening. So to continue to follow up, mm. we moved her to a different team and she loves, loves it now. So um, it's, it was just kind of an ongoing thing, but but specifically to just look for one, like just start one, if you can just do one or two every week to just continue to build on that, um, then it really does become a contagious culture of other people doing the same thing. Yeah, I think sometimes we're so focused on getting new volunteers, we forget the power and necessity of retaining the volunteers we already have. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons we lose people is because they don't like what they're doing and they're burned out and nobody knows it. Nobody's asked them how they're doing. And so I'm really proud of our team in this season because everybody really has let go of their own departmental agendas. And the goal has become like not filling up my roster. It's developing, finding spirit, people's spiritual gifts and getting them into their sweet spot. So everybody on our team, they're switching people around. They're, you know, helping people discover where it is that they're truly going to come alive and feel like, they're being effective and actually look forward to, you know, engaging people online, engaging people in person. And so I think being willing to um, check in with people, have conversations, know where people are thriving and where they're not um, so that we're adding new people to the team and growing the people who are already there. Yeah. And I, yeah. Would, I would just definitely say that it has really been led with prayer um, and through the process of, of the COVID season, especially coming back in person, um, we've had to just honestly grieve well, the people that mm. haven't come back, the volunteers that were all star before COVID that we thought would come back and they haven't. And we had to really be honest and grieve that well as a team, as a staff. And then we really had to make the choice to just prayerfully ask God, who are the people you are bringing us now and, mm. and choose to dream ahead for, to see what he is doing and the new people he's bringing there and prayerfully just ask him to show us, you know, the people that, that, that can serve in those places. And so that's been a really cool experience, just letting the Holy Spirit lead the way there. Well, and I noticed uh, that night at the onesies, um, you, uh, you, you, you sang a song, uh, like, uh, from, from Hamilton, speaking of people for coming back, <laughs> tell us, tell us a little about, a little, little about the bit. And then uh, the, in the show notes, we'll have to, we'll have to put the, the lyrics, but, uh, <laughs> tell us, tell us a little about the fun you had. Yeah. Well, my wife kind of pushed me into it. <laughs> It's all about making a fool of yourself, you know, for the one, for our volunteers. But yeah, I kind of in my, in the opening bit, you know, had made, just kind of made some jokes about, you know, if there's one good thing that's come out of the pandemic is that everybody agrees about everything now. <laughs> and it's made my job a lot easier <laughs> and uh, had some fun with, you know, we have four kids and they never agree about anything. And even having a, a fun family movie night turns into a diplomatic peace summit. <laughs> and um and so 
we kind of took that into, you know, the one thing we haven't uh, tried yet in getting everybody to come back is this whole authoritarian leader thing. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, I put the uh, I put the crown on and the gray wig um, like uh, like King George and Hamilton. <laughs> Let's go and, for it here. For those who are watching along, we should just see it. Yeah, we uh -huh. sang our uh, we sang a little rendition that my wife and our 12 year old daughter wrote of uh, you'll be back. <laughs> our threat you know to our people but uh yeah you'll be back. Handsome. Uh, yeah. well you're, you're that's a good fantastic singer. you're a good singer it was a funny moment uh and I, I cried laughing listening to you and it was actually i thought for me just noticing it and hearing what you just said there uh leah about the notion of grieving those who have left and volunteers was i actually thought Maybe I'm just observing and saying maybe it's true, but um, it's almost like by by singing, by making the silly song. Uh, um, for those I've heard, you know, King George comes out in Hamilton, you know, sings "You'll Be Back," the colonies will be back, and so this was the pastor singing about his uh, his his lost his lost attenders and volunteers, and and you'll be back. And it was actually kind of this own cathartic moment for you, I think, because yeah. there's this there's this way that it's like well if we can't if we can't make them come back we can at least laugh about it about the irony of our situation and things we can control and things we can't control and um as i said it'd be fun um uh if, if you're ever feeling up for it to re-record that then we'll we'll certainly put it we'll certainly put it in the show notes for people but otherwise we'll at least put the uh we'll just put the uh the the, the lyrics because i thought they were inspired and um and i think it reflects again this sense of not taking yourself so seriously of being willing to laugh, of being willing to laugh at the circumstances, of having fun together, uh, of also being true. You know, hey, there was a line you had, you guys, you guys realize we're actually back in service now, right? <laughs> <laughs> so you guys can come on Sunday morning in person. Uh, and and uh, I love that you said uh, people people were proving that um, uh, that they didn't need to come to church to be late to church, even if you just, all you have to do is open a computer screen. <laughs> so uh, there were some-, there were some That, that must moments. have been cathartic for your church too just to kind of name what everybody else was feeling, was it? Yeah, it was. And, you know, we've had so, you know, it's been such a polarizing, divisive couple of years, but humor is a safe way to talk about things. Mm -hmm. And when you begin to laugh about things like that, it really, I think, disarms people, helps everybody not take themselves too seriously. Everybody kind of takes a deep breath and realizes we're going to get through this. We all really do love each other. <laughs> Oh, that's great. Well, Leah and Brad, can't thank you enough for being with us today on Church Pulse Weekly. Um, David, we've got all kinds of material inside Barna Access Plus on volunteering, on giving, and um, many other things. You can find it all by going to barna.com slash access and use the code, the promo code Church Pulse, all one word, to get 20% off an annual subscription. So thanks so much for being with us, Brad and Leah, David. Thank you as always. Thank you to those of you who are watching and listening. You saw King George III, is it? Um, you know, here today on Church Pulse Weekly, not an everyday occasion. And if you enjoyed it, subscribe, share it with your friends. We'll catch you next time on Church Pulse Weekly.